days and two to three nights. So what we're going to try to do is cover several chapters and just hit the highlights of what was in that chapter that we learned about and uh, talk about why it was important. So we won't be following notes and won't be going into detail. There's not even any pretty pictures on the slides like I normally do. Uh, but we want to just talk about the meat of it. And uh, this will be the kind of session that if you've got some input, um, you know, feel free to raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you so that uh, we can do an interactive if, if that's what you're comfortable with. We do have some announcements and some requests. The uh, Pollard family, uh, Brother Pollard's funeral is Friday. I believe the visitation is at 2 and the funeral at 3. And that's at the Clayton Church of God. Also, the Woodard family, we are canceling Sunday school Sunday morning. Uh, there will be no Sunday school here at, at Garner. We will have a worship service at 1030. And uh, it is going to be abbreviated because the visitation begins at 1 o'clock. And the funeral is at 2 o'clock. And uh, the family tried to get it pushed out a little further, but they couldn't do it. And uh, so we're trying to accommodate uh, that schedule by abbreviating the worship service to give everyone time to run, get a bite to eat, and then come back for the visitation. So again, visitation at 1, the funeral at 2, no Sunday school, and worship service at 1030. And be in prayer for both families. Uh, that uh, are experiencing such a great loss. Uh, we've lost two great men that were uh, a great part of this church for a long time. Um, I haven't had a chance to speak to Sister Pope. I saw her come in, but I've got her up here on my prayer list that we continue to remember uh, Sister Melinda in prayer. Um, let's continue to remember those that have lost loved ones and also those that uh, have experienced death recently in the family and are experiencing such a grave loss. Um, so let's remember them in prayer. Is there anyone else that has a prayer request? Yeah. Really hard. Okay, let's remember Puerto Rico and that um, earthquake. Anyone else? Okay, if the ushers will come forward, we will pray over the offering as well as... Let's remember our troops that were deployed. Okay. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your blessings, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you for all that you do and continue to do for us, Lord. And we put our faith and our trust and our confidence in you. Lord, when we cry out and call to you, Lord Jesus, we do it in faith and we trust and we believe. Lord, we place these prayer requests, these needs into your hand, Lord, because we know that you're able to do exceedingly above all that we can do, imagine, or think. So we place it confidently in your hands. Lord, we ask you, God, that you would touch the offering tonight and use it for the service of your work. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay. So the anointing, we're talking about the fresh anointing, and we look at chapter 1, and what did we talk about in chapter 1? Um, we started out with Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 5, and it begins with this phrase, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me. So we look at the purpose of the anointing, and it talks about building the house, a call to restore, because God's priority or God's purposes are what we are to give priority to. So he calls us to restore. Uh, he sends an outpouring of the Holy Spirit for the purpose of anointing you to do the work of God. So if we're going to do the work of God, we need the Holy Spirit to give us the strength. And then he gives us not only a call to restore, why do we have to restore? 
but a call to renewal, a relationship and fellowship with God. If we're going to have a relationship and a fellowship with God, then there has to be a healing first. And that is the anointing's purpose. The anointing comes to us to first restore us, to make us whole, to uh, fix what's broken, that breach that's there. And so he restores us, and then he restores them. Uh, what we are talking about there is that we can't be a blessing until we ourselves have been restored. Also, before he can restore that thing that maybe has been lost in them, uh, they have to be renewed and restored. So we see here the purpose of the anointing. We take a look at the holy anointing oil. And in that day, it was commonly associated with cleansing or purity. And we know that purity brings peace. And I put the little phrase there, no purity, no peace. So it makes me whole. The holy anointing oil makes me whole. How? So the oil of the Holy Spirit comes not only to heal me, but to heal me inside out. He has to heal me on the inside. And then we see it as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And so it does two things. It cleanses and purifies. Uh, the anointing makes me whole. I cannot minister effectively until God, by His Holy Spirit, first ministers to me. And that brings to me purity and wholeness in my relationship with Him. So the Holy Spirit comes to heal me from the inside out. And then thirdly, we know that the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. When the anointing comes, I'm no longer longer alone. I have got him. So the oil of the Spirit then brings to me the abiding presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this anointing brings to me the ability to do God's work. So without the anointing, I don't have the ability to do what I need to do, what I'm called to do. And so God comes alongside through the person of the Holy Spirit, and suddenly he enables me. He gives me the enablement that I need in order to do what he's called me to do. And then he, um, the anointing also separates us. It separates us for a purpose, for an office, for a calling. And so he calls us out and he cleanses us. He makes that, he brings us that peace and he makes that breach or that break. He cleans, he fixes that and he cleanses us and he brings us that purity. And then he's got us set apart for a purpose. There's a reason that he has done this for us. And so Isaiah 61 and 1 through 3 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord, ha Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So we see here this scripture in the light of what we just talked about. How in the world can we do this without the anointing of the Spirit of God? He comes upon us and he helps us so that we can minister to these things that it's talking about here. And so... Isaiah had said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he lists there four conditions of pain and four responses of the community of the redeemed to those conditions. So we see these conditions uh, and it, all the pain that it brings. And he lists the pains there and give us four conditions here. But there's a job of the redeemed to do something about it. First, the meek. There's a great deal of pressure that is felt on this person. But the meek keeps themselves under control. They don't give up and they don't break. They're nice, they're sweet, they're meek, and most of all, their tongue is restrained. Is that a challenge or what? Amen. 
been broken hearted. It talks about trying to take the pressure, but their heart is broken. Life is beating them up. They've been taking it meekly. They're trying to be Christ-like, but inside of them, their heart is broken. And many times we see them on the job or we see them at church. We don't even recognize it maybe. They're sitting right there with us, but they're broken hearted. And we, the church, the redeemed, are called to minister to them. But we need the anointing in order to be able to do it, to be successful at it. And then the next thing is the captive. He calls us to those. They don't know if they're going to be able to get out of the situation that they're in. They feel trapped. What am I going to do about my marriage, about this debt that I've got, this wild child that I have? How am I going to make a living? I can't find a job. And so they feel trapped. Every which way they turn, life is pressing in on them. So instead of the word captive here, Jesus used the term bruised. And that is a descriptive term that talks about an inner battering, an inner beating, a condition that leaves the individual thoroughly crushed, so oppressed that they despair of life and they begin to lose the will to go on. And so here are people who have lost the reason to live. And it doesn't matter what station in life we have, there are times when the meekness becomes broken heartedness and then broken heartedness begins to give way to a feeling of despair, of being so bruised they see no reason to go on. And then bondage. Finally, captivity then goes to bondage. And we start to see a picture of complete dysfunction they can no longer respond in a practical way to crisis anymore. They break down and they can't handle it and they cannot respond to life anymore. Meek, I'm taking it, but I can't take it anymore. Broken hearted, my heart is breaking on the inside. The captive, the enemy says, you ain't getting out of this one. You're stuck. And bondage says, I'm so overwhelmed, I'm unable to respond to life at all. So we see a picture of those that we're called to minister to. And so the thing is the power. The anointing comes, he said, and that is the purpose. This is it precisely why the anointing comes. It brings the power to respond to these conditions that we're facing in our world. We can't change many things that I talked about previously, but we can through the power and the Spirit of God. That is precisely why we need the anointing. Without that supernatural Natural enabling, we're just like uh, the Lions Club or any other social work that goes on. Um, but this is, uh, at, we could be an encouragement maybe doing that, and maybe it's a worthy work. But he calls the church to bring people to complete wholeness. Uh, I always thought a lot about holiness, H-O-L-I-N-E-S-S, but we are called to wholeness, to restore people to a condition like God had for them all along before they uh, uh, were brought down by the enemy. So that's the reason why we so desperately need the anointing. Because under the anointing, we feel the strength and we can speak up with power and authority. And we can give them the good news. And we do it with authority in our voice. Not because that we are anything special, but because of whose we are and who we represent. And so we see the condition of the world that we live in today and we stand up bold and we pronounce the good news to those people. To the pain of the world, we offer the power of good news. We bind up the brokenhearted. Um, we give them compassion and gentleness. That, that's qualities that they don't normally face out in the world. We are looking to heal and restore. And so in order to do it, if I were going to give any 
a positive benefit to anybody in terms of trying to heal them and restore them. We have to show compassion and gentleness. And so that's where that love as a Christian comes in. It's so critical that it dictates to us our walk. So to the captive, we declare liberty. And it gives people the opportunity for a fresh start. They see that there was no way they could get out of their situation. And all of a sudden, they see you or hear you speak with authority and power in your voice. And they begin to believe that they can get a fresh start and begin this life again. When you feel this and you feel that heartbeat, God has purpose for you. And he is not ready for you until he calls you home. And as long as your heart is beating, he has got purpose for each and every one of us in here. And he blends those purposes together to cause us to be the living church of God, that we can speak to a lost and dying world and speak hope and help when they see no way out of what they're living in. Amen. We are a blessed people. We know the Lord, but there are those that don't have the assurance like we do. And so we see here, we notice that the anointing is with purpose. Um, it affects the character of our message, the quality of our relationships, the perspective that we offer people, the authority and the confidence that we display when we offer these liberating good news. So we see here those who mourn would be greeted with comfort. Those who've been touched by a tragedy would be crowned with beauty. Those who have the spirit of heaviness would be offered the garment of praise. I don't know about you, but I've been in the place of heaviness. And I have been able, because someone offered up a prayer and got through to God, and the Holy Spirit began to come in, and he placed a garment of praise over that spirit of heaviness. And there's nothing that I could do to get out of my situation, but God did the work. Can I get a witness? So he will do the work in us if we will let him move through us. Amen? He can get it to us if we'll get it if he can get it through us. And so we see here um, the transformation here. They are transformed when they begin to put their faith and their confidence in God. They don't see a way out, but they begin to say, well, maybe this is the way that I can get out of this situation. And so finally we see here the fruit of righteousness. We see a picture of stability. They've been uprooted, uh, the Israelites had. They were in captivity and they've been uprooted and they've been brought back to the homeland um, and they were to uh, be planted in the land again. Their fruit was to be righteousness. So first, the restoration is to a beaten and broken people. The power of the Holy Spirit came to renew, heal, and restore. To renew, to heal, and to restore. To establish a new order so that they would yield the fruit of righteousness. And then God does a work of renewal in them. First he did a renewal of them, and now he's doing a renewal in them. He begins to work through them, and the evidence of the anointing is internal transformation. You begin to see that they don't think like they used to think. They don't act like they used to act, and that's because the good news has begun to take root in their heart and their life, and this anointing has come upon them, and they're beginning to see that they have purpose and they're called to the purposes of God. And so this anointing begins to heal them. Then these renewed individuals will turn and after they've become renewed, they begin to renew others, the community around them. Those who were wounded, 
now become healers. You say, Sister Herring, I thought you prayed and God healed. He does. And when he heals us, spiritually or physically, whatever way, we are then called to become healers. We're to go out and spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and offer hope and help to a lost and dying world. So now they become implementers of change and renewal. And you see, if that doesn't happen, Happen, there's a problem because we the church must insist that once the Holy Spirit of God resides in us and we have given our heart and, and everything to the Lord Jesus Christ and we're allowing him to dictate the purposes of God in our lives we then reach a point where there has to be transformation that shows. Transformation may have been going on inside of us and people may not have been seeing all that God was doing. But there comes a time when you've got to man up and say, okay, I am now what uh, a vessel that can be used. I'm not what I'm going to be, but I'm better than I was, and God's calling me to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I get a witness? So that transformation has to come. People have to recognize that there's something that has come about in your life. We are to build up, to raise up, and to repair the broken down places. Okay? Then the next one we see here when the anointing comes we are moved to build up and I call this restoration. You won't find it like that in your book but that's what I call it. It's restoration. The anointing comes and it causes us to build up to bring renewal to that which was in disrepair. It is a work of restoration and we rebuild it on a sure foundation. That foundation is what? He said he's building the church Church on a sure foundation. He said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. So we know that he's the one that's building the church. And anything that he does, we can count it a success. We know that it's going to be good. So I call that restoration. It causes us to build up, to bring renewal to that which is in dis disrepair. And it's built on a sure foundation. I call the next one, it's not a just a material transformation, but we see here the anointed community is to impact its city, transforming the state of relationships. So in other words, people will look and they will see that harmony and peace exist first in your homes and then in your church and then in your workplace and all of a sudden they say, I'm working with a crazy person. They promoted her, uh, somebody around her three times and she ain't quit. She ain't raised king. She just keeps on showing up every day and doing her work. Amen. And so we call that transformation. That that's the light of Jesus Christ shining through you. And sometimes things don't always go like you write the story. Things don't always go to where you say, you know, people will say, well, why is she taking that so good? And you even think to yourself, Lord, have you forgot my promotion slip or have you forgot my blessing? Have you forgot this or that or the other? But he's keeping up the accounting. He's got the books. And there's one thing about it. They'll balance out. You can trust him on that. And you can take that one to the bank. The books will balance. And so we look for transformation in our lives. And when something doesn't go right and we don't get what we want, we say, well, Lord, where are you? You forgot me. You overlooked me. What's going on, Lord? What's happening? You know, we get all hot and bothered. And all the time, he's working for our good good. He's doing something that we can't see, feel, touch, or know right then, but it's coming all out in the end for our good. So transformation is required. And then I call the next one righteousness. It says the root problem of city desolation rises out of family disintegration. One generation cannot transmit to the next I'm going to repeat that. One generation cannot transmit to the next what it does not possess in terms of spiritual health and righteousness. You cannot pass what you don't have. Man, we've got to have it if we're going to pass it to the next generation. And we've got to understand that it ain't just the talk, but it's the walk. 
You know, if our teenagers will see us leaving a cart out in the middle of the street at the grocery store because we don't want to take time, we're too important to go put it back where it belongs, do you think that don't make an impression on them? WWJD. I mean, we heard that till I was about sick of it. What would Jesus do? You know? And I said, what happened to understanding that there are right and wrong? And our kids are looking at us. Our teenagers in this church and young people, young adults, are looking at us. And it's up to us to possess it so we can pass it. Can I get a witness? Okay, so uh, the last one is desolation, I call it. It's um, moral duplicity was going on in Israel, oppression and cruelty, deviation from the law of God. And so they were, it, all of this was contributing to uh, what was called desolation to families. Um, the family desolation resulted in the social fragmentation of the cities. So Israel's families were going down the tubes, and so therefore the city was going down the tubes. We understand here, the anointing should change the character of the community. He says in 61 6a, but you be but you shall be named the priest of the Lord. They shall call you the ministers of our God. We have to understand we are called to ministry. We are called not as maybe pulpit ministers, but we're all called to minister. And we read the verse earlier what our, our job requirement was. And so then in um, slide 7 here of the Babylonian exile, we see that the dream of Isaiah's uh, post-exilic community was not to be. All that Isaiah outlived, Israel failed to achieve. So we see here that 500 years after the Babylonian exile, Jesus began his ministry declaring that God has not abandoned the vision of an anointed company of priests who declare to the nations the year of Jubilee. So we see here Fast forward, Jesus calls the twelve to be ministers of God. And so we understand here that that ministry was passed on to them. They were to disciple, and that's what he, his calling and his anointing on them was for. Everything that we see in the text that we looked at in Isaiah is at the heart of the purpose of God for his church. And that is so critical for us to remember. What we saw in that text in Isaiah is the church's marching orders. It should be the heart throb of the church. You say, well, look out, Sister Ellen. They'll take advantage of you. They'll run all over the church if you let them. Well, that ain't my problem. That's Mike's problem. He got to hold on to the money bags. I ain't got to worry about that. Seriously, too many times I hear us being negative about reaching out and helping. And there's things that you can do, and it all ain't about, you know, giving somebody a dollar. There are things that we can do. And sometimes it takes going out of your way a little bit. Uh-oh, did I say that out loud? We have to go out of our way. I think I better go back to teaching. I started to preaching. It's hard to go out of our way because we're busy and we want to do what we want to do in the time limit that we want to do it. And I admire people that will go by and buy a big old long Subway sandwich and carry it to a family that has just literally lost a loved one. They're the first ones there. You know, and all of a sudden they show up with food. We had to go out, she had to go out of her way to do that. We as a church have to have that kind of spirit. That's the thing that I'm talking about is there's a purpose for the church. And it is not just to bless us for and no more, but it's to reach out. Okay. All right, so let's look at the problem. We see a world in pain. God sent his power, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So if we have the power, which if we say that we believe in the Holy Spirit, that it strengthens us and gives us power. So if we've got that power, what's the problem? Why is the church not liberating the oppressed, raising up the ruins, and building a community on the earth of faith? So we see here one of the problems is conformity to our culture. 
We look at a broken world that unfortunately is influencing us a lot of times more than the church is influencing them. How can we allow the Bible to be taken out of our schools? How can we allow 1.5 million abortions every year? And that statistic was from 10 years ago. So it's worse now. How can we allow our schools to be retail outlets for illegal drugs? How can all of these things that are in our society happen? Brother Doug says the great sin of the church today is not rebellion against God. It is a conformity to our culture. And in Worldliness, Stuart Ewing's book, he says that we are wrapped up in the concept of image. We are obsessed by image. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Look on the Facebook. Image, image, image. That hand's got to be placed so that hip's got to be thrown a certain way. Them lips has got to be all sucked up like a duck. I ain't never in my life. We are all consumed with what the world is excited about. When we look at it, we should be saying, what am I doing to show forth who resides in me? And if the Holy Spirit resides in us, then what have we got to be ashamed about? What have we got, you know? I, anyway, let's get back to it. It says that we, we have to not conform to our culture, but to show forth the love of Jesus Christ and show forth who resides within us. This worldliness is what is trying to take over. We're being manipulated by an ad-oriented materialistic culture. And then we look at materialism. Uh, if we look at it, he said, uh, Jesus said to use material things to satisfy material needs and to use spiritual things to satisfy spiritual needs. Our culture says that material things will satisfy your spiritual needs, but that is not true. The church with its gospel of prosperity and introduces Jesus as a way of getting rich so that you can be happy like the world is happy has gone down the wrong road. That is not our definition. And so we, we must visualize and look at a situation through our spiritual eyes and understand what materialism is. And then we have discontent. Paul declared, I have learned that in whatsoever state I am to be content. Philippians 4 and 11. He continued, whether he had been abounded or abased, his external circumstances could not alter his internal happiness. And he could have said it another way. He could have said, I've set my eyes on Jesus and I am flooded with fulfillment and I don't need all that stuff. Could have said it that way. If Brother Bill Woodard was here tonight, he would tell you, none of that stuff matters a bit in this world. A quick story, Brother Bill goes into the restaurant, he sees the high prices in New Orleans, and uh, so the waiter come up with that towel hanging over his arm, and he says, you know, what would you like? And Brother Bill, uh, Bill Wooder said, well, I'll just take a dish of ice cream. And the waiter said, well, there's a cover charge of 20 bucks, $20. Brother Wooder looked at me and I said, that means that you're going to pay $20 for that dish of ice cream if that's all you order. He whooped that menu back like that. He said, in that case, I'll have a steak and a baked potato. And he went ahead and ordered that food. When I walked out of the restaurant, I said, Brother Woodard, I said, are you okay? Is everything okay? Because it was expensive. I said, are you okay? Is everything okay with you? Because somebody else had, you know, taken us. Brother Woodard said, well, I learned something. I said, what's that? He said, you ain't never too old to learn. So if he's up there tonight, he, uh, looking down at us, he would tell us that, you know, we can still learn these concepts. We can still learn these things because the world tries to make you feel less than, whether it's financially, 
or your uh, f physique or whatever. The world will tell you you're not enough. You're less than. But contentment, Brother Bill would say, is not in things. Contentment is an enduring and balanced relationship with Jesus Christ. And then we see a lack of passion. God is looking for a church that would rise up and say to the materialism of our culture, you hear me. Who cares about your materialism? Other things are of much more importance because that's the only thing that can bring us wholeness, peace, and joy is to flow in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And we must be willing to differentiate ourselves from culture for that reason. And so I'm just... I've got a made-up mind on this, that if we're going to flow in the anointing of the Spirit, we must be willing to dif differentiate ourselves from the culture of this old world. We cannot be of the world. We have got to let the flow of the anointing direct our paths. Okay? Let's go to slide 10 here. The absence of courage. We find here the church seems to have lost the moral courage to significantly differentiate from its culture. With the will to differentiate ourselves, we could stand and say to the world, I'm following another value system. It matters to me more what God thinks than what you think. Today, most churches are, have lost the will to differentiate themselves from the world and are being manipulated by the world. And then we see passion. Um, Soren was quoted as, Our culture will die not because of rebellion, but because of a lack of spiritual passion. You know, when you're in a service and a minister has to say, continuously and constantly, give praise to the Lord, or what he's doing is, I'm working myself to death up here and I'm not getting anything back from the congregation. I can't read you. You're not really responding. You're sitting there looking, what did you, you used to say, mule eating briars? Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sometimes is the way we look because we're just sitting there, you know. Now, if we're sitting there and it's just we sitting on the edge of our seat and we just about to take off and tear off, that's all right. But uh, if, if we're not, we, we need to be in there heaping coals of fire on his head and helping him because he's trying to preach what God has laid on his heart to, to give us. So... We see here the passion. Um, Sunday after Sunday, uh, things begin to be more important to some people than uh, what's going on. The pursuit of the holy, the altar, or the worship, the passionate and or prayerful intercession uh, for our godless communities and those that are lost and undone without the Lord. And so um, you remember we talked about a story there where um, the little boy, uh, his aunt started sharing with him, but then all of a sudden church was over, so she stopped her class and wouldn't tell him the rest of the story. She wanted to go home and eat, and we talked about the story that night. That's what this is talking about. It's a passion. It's not just standing up and repeating the words, but it's feeling a fire that's burning in here. You've got to deliver. It. You've got to tell somebody the story. Amen? And so that has to be our passion. And let us build our buildings, hire our staff, get our computers and modernize. Nothing wrong with it. But I want us to remember that unless we have something very old-fashioned, the touch of the Holy Spirit, the simple story of Jesus, the values of the timeless book, the Bible, we have nothing nothing to offer our world. And then over in chapter 2, we see the recipe for the anointing. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, anointed me to proclaim the good news to those who are poor. We read those scriptures. And so they say, uh, we see here when he closed the book and he sat down, is this not Joseph's son? And they were offended by him. They were offended. You know why? They were where the Bible reading was supposed to be done at. The difference was that his words had power. He spoke with authority, and he had power. And that made them mad. They were offended by him. 
So there's a fresh anointing available to the church. That is the purpose, fresh anointing, so that we can say to the meek, there's good news. To the brokenhearted, there's a healer. The captives, there's liber liberty. And to the bound, there's a way out. And to the world, that God is real. We don't just stand up there and read the word, but we do it with power. That's the purpose of the anointing. No human can heal a, ho a human heart. Only God can do that. Only God can do it. The anointing of the Spirit has to come to bring true deliverance to that person, to that heart, and to help them. And so we see that what has God called us to do? It is a supernatural task. It requires supernatural energy. And so only the Holy Spirit can do it. Um, we desperately need the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come upon us to help us do what He's called us to do. And what facilitates that? Anointing. It's associated with the oil. The oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And so in Exodus 30 and 22, it gives the recipe for the holy anointing oil. It says, take spices, 500 shekels of liquid, pure myrrh, and half as much sweet cinnamon, and the same amount of sweet cane, 500 shekels of cassia, all of these along with a hen of olive oil. So we see here myrrh, cinnamon, cane, sweet cane, cassia, and oil. You shall make from these a holy anointing oil. You shall anoint the tabernacle, the ark, the table, and all its utensils, the lampstand, the altar of incense, the altar of the burnt offering, and the laver. And so we see here the anointing is upon the people of his presence, which were the priest, the place of his presence, which was the tabernacle, and the purpose of his presence, which is the furniture. And so here at the place of his presence, who is the tabernacle? Jesus was, and today, here on earth, you and I are. We are the habitation of his presence. And so he sanctifies that holy relationship between himself and his people. He declares them to be his people for the purpose of carrying his glory. Man, when we are carrying his glory... What a job we have. What a calling we have. That Shekinah glory that we talk about and read about in the Word of God must be shining on us. It must set us apart. Aaron was set apart. And we see here that the glory of God sets you apart for his service. Amen. So we see here that we are anointed to be bearers of his glory. And so the purpose of his presence, he orders the anointing of all of the vessels, the articles of the furniture, all of them are anointed for service. These vessels all represent different ministries of God. And so we see here first the ark. There was an anointing upon the ark, the symbol of covenant between the, uh, the symbol of his covenant and the place of his glory. And in it was the rod which carries forth the authority, the manna which shows the provision, and the tablets which was the law. And on it was the means of covenant. We looked at in it the rod, the manna, the law, and on it was the means of covenant, which was the mercy seat. That mercy seat was sprinkled with blood. Then we go to the table. There's an anointing upon the table. The word is bread, the place of feeding. The priest laid out fresh bread. Never was the table to be without bread. Amen. Lampstand. There's an anointing upon the lampstand or the candlestick. It received a deposit of fresh oil daily. Fresh bread, fresh oil. Seven dancing flames of fire. And there in that picture, you see the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. And what does it do? It produces fruit and fire. 
fruit and fire. So we are to be productive. I used to work at a company that uh, they had to do so many um, inductors uh, per hour and uh, they were graded on how well they were able to meet that goal. Um, and we would have to adjust up or down. Maybe, you know, a, a machine, a winding machine uh, broke a bobbin or a head, at, uh, you know, and we had to shut it down uh, and they had to move so they lost 30 minutes of productivity. We would credit them for that. Did you ever think about that God is looking at our productivity? He's looking and measuring what we are doing for him and the results of what we're doing. And I submit to you that we don't have have a whole lot of control over the results, but we got a whole lot of control over what we are doing for the Lord, and we are called to be productive. And so we see here the incense. There's an anointing upon the altar of incense. It burned twice daily, and the incense represented the ministry of prayer, of communion with God, of listening and discovering His will and His ways. And that listening part is important too. It's great to pour out our hearts to God and to tell Him all the things that have got us burdened down and all the things that we need. And then we get real excited and we just bubble over and tell Him how much we love Him and all of that. But don't jump up and run out of His presence. In fact, when we come into His presence, begin to think about all of this furniture that each and every piece of the furniture had purpose. And so we need to stop catch our breath and enter into his presence remember who you're walking into to commune with and so don't run in there out of breath and rushing to get her done so you can check it off the list of to do but listen to him and then we see the brass altar it's anointed. It's the place where the lamb was slain for the sins of man. It's where the sinner received grace because another received our judgment. It Here, the, the man could receive uh, a response or could give a response, I apologize, to God's mercy, the gift of himself, the gift of himself in his burnt offering. So what do I give to the Lord? I give of myself as a burnt offering. And in the peace offering, we could celebrate reconciliation with God. So when I go in, I look at his mercy and I offer him the burnt offering of myself. And then I turn around and I celebrate the peace offering because he reconciled me to him that I might even be able to enter in to his presence. There's the laver. The laver's made of mirrors and filled with water. And it was anointed. This anointing represents the priority of purity, of a continual self-examination, a need for clean hands, uh, pure deeds, and clean feet. And remember that it comes out of a pure heart. And they would walk in, and they would look down at the laver, and it had a mirror in it, and it had water. And that mirror was to examine themselves. Uh, and that's what we talk about in sanctification how we are reviewing what we are doing, our deeds and our clean feet. And so there's an anointing upon the altar, the ministry of blood, the altar, the ministry of water, which is the laver, the ministry of oil, which is the lampstand, the ministry of bread, which is the table, the ministry of incense, which is the golden art altar, and the ministry of mercy and covenant, which is the ark. So saying it another way, there's an anointing upon the ministry of the church when man meets the lamb and is redeemed at the altar. Man meets the word and is sanctified the laver. Man meets the oil, which is the lampstand, and is renewed by the Spirit. Man meets bread and is strengthened by the word, which is the table. And man meets and communes with God, which is the ark, our place of safety. And then we look at the anointing upon the tabernacle 
is the anointing of his presence. The anointing upon the vessels is an anointing of his purposes for the church. So the anointing of Aaron is an anointing for an office. In the Old Testament, there were three main offices, principal offices, king, prophet and priest. And so God wants an anointing upon the king, an anointing to rule and provide positive direction, ruling with grace. The prophet to speak forth things of God in a revelatory sense, clarifying vision and direction, to correct, to call for pure values and holy living, and the priest to build bridges to be reconcilers. So we see here the people who fulfilled his purposes bring the unredeemed into the place of his presence where they can, they bring him into the place of his presence where they can be redeemed and touched by his blood, purged by the water of his word, fed at his table, filled with his spirit, set afire as a light in the dark world, and to pray at his altar, brought upon and unto his mercy. In other words, hidden in Christ, the ark, to the end that his glory rest on them. The anointing is an empowerment. The anointing is an empowerment. And so, I think I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Um, the anointing is an empowerment for our spiritual man. The man becomes the mind of Christ. And at that point, our emotions become energized with the joy of the Lord and the peace of God. And too often, when we come in contact with the oil, our lives are less than transformed. Too many times, people are satisfied with just the cold chills, the goosebumps rather than understanding that when I come in contact with the oil, I will be transformed. This old man regenerates and we become a new man. We can allow it to become less than a life transforming happening. But that's not what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to change our lives. We feel wonderful. Our attitudes and our behaviors, though, remain unchanged. It was the genuine oil of the Spirit, but we poured it upon flesh because we did not allow the anointing to make us the people of His purposes. And then we see here, how can we tell the true oil of the Spirit, the true anointing? What can we say which is false and which is true? You look at the recipe, pure myrrh, you see here, myrrh says it's a sweet spice, but it means bitter. It's bitter to the taste and sweet to the smell. We've got to learn to taste the bitter and don't continue to spread the bitter, but when we taste the bitter, give off sweet. That is not easy. But when hard things come our way, we have got to speak peace. And that's what he's calling us to do. So when he says you cannot remain unchanged, it means that if you are going to let it flow right on through you and that bitter comes to you and you're spouting that bitter off everywhere you go that day, then that's where we're failing. We're remaining unchanged. We have to allow him to change us and let the sweet come. Sweet smelling cinnamon, the word means to stand upright, and it's the idea of righteousness, holiness, and purity. But the problem with uprightness, it's offensive to the world. So be prepared to be rejected by your upright standards. When you do the right thing, the world does not understand you. They've got a different set of values. Calamus is a particular species that not only grows but has adapted to thrive in the miry clay. If I'm to be a vessel through which God pours His Holy Spirit, I have got to learn to let every barrier in me be broken to become a channel for the oil of His Spirit. 
will be like calamus, tough enough to survive in miry clay, to thrive in an inhospitable environment, to rise again after the winds of adversity have seemed to lay us low. What I'm talking about is not easy, but the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God strengthens us as we allow him to help us to thrive like this calamus. And then cassia is an aromic uh, shrub, has a purple shriveled flower that appears to bow down. It's a picture of worship. Whatever beauty I have, I would then give it back to him in reverent worship. You see, worship is the key element here. The choice between whether I've got an orientation towards myself or whether I've got it towards Christ. So when the winds of adversity blow, when the hard times of life come, and I'm standing and it's getting worse all the time, and you can feel the muddy ground underneath your feet, you just bend low in worship to the one that can do something about it. Because you can't do a thing about it. So you just stand there, and Sister Deborah, when it starts to slip, Sliding you on down and you're not even in control. You bow down in your worship and you will stand firm as you ever will stand because God will not let your foot slip. Can I get an amen? Amen to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I lost my place here. Woo. How do I get the holy anointing oil? I need four things to mix with the oil of the Spirit. Myrrh, although bitterness touches my life, I'm going to stay sweet. Cinnamon, I'm going to stand upright. I'm going to be holy. Calamus, I'll be a channel of His Spirit. And I'm not only going to stand there, but I'm going to thrive in that miry clay. And then Cassia, I will take the beauty of the Lord and give it back to Him. Truly anointed people are worshipers. Amen. That's how we know. How do we facilitate the anointing coming through us? Stay sweet. Be holy. Thrive in the clay. Be a worshiper. God commands, don't pour this on flesh. What he is saying is, don't stay like you used to stay. When my spirit says to you, uh, uh, that wasn't a good thought. Don't let that come out your mouth. Obey me. Worship me. And change what I'm showing you to change. There are four tests. If the person who appears to be moving in the anointing is bitter, angry, hard, cynical, it's counterfeit. If the person doesn't stand upright for holiness and purity, God will lift his true anointing. If the person doesn't have survivability, they cannot learn to let their faith sustain them. And I just got directed by the Spirit. When I said that he will lift his true anointing, you take a look at what we studied about the life of Saul. He prophesied all night. He thought he still had it. The people looked around and said, what is this? What's going on? He must still have the goods. Man, he's good. It was the mercy of God trying to get through hard-headed Saul. And so when we look at that, we see that he will lift his true anointing. If the person doesn't have survivability, they cannot learn to let their faith sustain them. They want to see it, touch it, feel it, and know it. If the person isn't a worshiper who bows low before God, taking whatever he gives him and laying it at his feet, he is perverting the anointing with his own self-centeredness. And I submit to you that when we, in our conversation, and it can happen to all of us, we get stressed, we get under pressure, we get under the gun, so to speak. But when we begin to start everything with I, 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 me, mine, and us four and no more is a big danger signal to us. The Holy Spirit will prompt us and he'll call us in line because we are to bow low and worship the Almighty. Everything that I have came at the hand of God. 
every good and perfect thing that I've ever experienced in my life came from God. Over and over again. Gave me the right job that I enjoyed the kind of work I did. At the end, I was glad to, you know, get a little bit of relief. But he gave me good job. He gave me health. And when it was threatened, and they said, you know, patient has a mass in the right lung, metastasized in the liver and spleen. We thought it was checkout time. God said different. I don't write the end of the story, but I can tell you one thing. I want to stand before him and hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You stood there like a rod. You took it. You let the anointing of the Holy Spirit flow through you so that others could be touched and reached. We need to worship him. And when we come together as a community of believers, we cannot look for, you know, the person to my left or the person to my right to do my worship for me. We've got to worship him for ourselves. And when we have to beg and plead and moan and groan, try to get somebody to please worship the Lord, I don't think it's pleasing to the Father. And so uh, I need to close. It's 830. I cannot tell you how full my spirit feels. I was supposed to cover four chapters. I just finished chapter two. So uh, I guess you'll have to get Brother J.D. to fire me. But um, I just thank the Lord that he recalls to our minds all the times that he stepped in the gap, stood there while we may have been weak, while we may even have made a mistake, while we were struggling with our own selves about which direction to go or what to do or how to handle this or maybe we even lost our temper. Whatever happened, he didn't deny us. He sent his Holy Spirit to build us up and to say, you can do better. Get up, dust your knees off, and get back up fighting. And so as we stand there on that miry clay, I want you to recall that picture because when we make up our mind that none of these things are going to move us, that we're going to serve the Lord no matter what, there is nothing, nothing that can knock us down. And if you think that your stubbornness is enough to do it, it's not. But your stubbornness plus the anointing of the power of the Holy Ghost, you will win. You will win. But it's when you want to sit on the fence and be wishy-washy and not take a stand and just do a 70 just enough to get by. There's that miserable feeling all the time. Don't you know that Saul knew he was going down the wrong road? You know, any time he, he didn't wait for the prophet and the priest. He jumped there and said, I can do the job just as good as he can. I don't need him. You know, I've been anointed. They poured oil all over. Samuel poured oil all over my head. Well, I can pull a gallon on your head, but you don't step out of office as we studied. So let's thank the Lord for what he's done for us, and let's treasure that we are given the gift of the power of the Spirit of God, that we have that fresh anointing, and that we can stand before him ramrod straight, proud that we serve a God that's able to help us make it all the way across the finish line. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Would you pray my closing prayer? Lord, we thank you today for your love and your mercy. We thank you for the teaching of your precious word. Pray that you'll be with each one of us as we leave here tonight, Lord. Pray that you'll bless Brother Wooder's family, Brother Donald's family. Be with each one of them, we pray. Guide us back to the house of God. In Jesus' name, amen.